and you don't have to say maybe or wait for me. To, to, to list things are the name of the game. Has anyone ever heard that phrase, listings are the name of the game? Sam, you heard that? Oh, have you ever heard that, Melissa? Okay, you heard that, okay. So let's talk about why listings are, we know that listings are the name of the game. Uh, one of the reasons that we know at K-1 that listings are the name of the game is because we have inserted that in our appeal. So either when people come in our office or our agents, they take appeal. You don't have to take it now, but you can take one of those lifesavers because uh, you all take a lifesaver. Take your peel, get your peel. Does anybody know what peel stands for? Prospecting. I know it's on the pig. You can't read the Oh, right, right, right. Does oh. anybody know what the peel stands for? The PEEL formula stands for Prospecting, Investing, oh, Listing, okay. and Learning. Okay. That's your key to success. So wherever you go, make sure that you take your PEEL. That's your formula to succeed in real estate. Top producers, any webinars, any workshops, any seminars that you go to, top producers are always saying, Get listings, get listings, get listings. Listings are the name of the game in real estate. Reverse the bias energy. And let me tell you what I mean by reverse the bias energy. Normally when we have a buyer, we have to take that buyer all over town. We have to burn out gas, we go to every show, and at least a good agent goes to every show, and they don't see their client and say, here's the lockbox code, go in and see. But normally, a good agent goes to every, every show and put their buyers. When they put a contract on that property, this is what they'll do. They'll follow up with the title company, they call the client, the client calls them all day, all night long. This is what happened. They talked to the other agent. They talked to the mortgage company. So they put out a lot of energy on that buyer. But when they get a listing, this is what they normally do. They normally get the listing agreement signed. They go and put a super box or a lock box, a regular lock box on the property. And then they wait for the property to sell. So if you take all that energy and all that work at those work ethics that you do with the buyer, Go to your uh, go to your showings. Go ahead, follow up with the lender, follow up with the other agent. Give your client a weekly, bi-weekly report on what's going on. So be in the business, and again, take that energy that you work with the buyer, take it and put it on your seller. But most times it's the opposite. We just wait for our property to be sold, and we don't do we don't do a lot of things, and that's not going to make you a good listing agent. The employee. When you're listing a property, you become the boss. You're the employer because you have everybody in the MLS, you have all the agents, you have all the buyers looking at properties, and so they're working for you. So you can go to Hawaii and every, you have all these thousands and thousands of agents working for you as opposed to if you work, I'm not saying don't work with buyers because buyers give us checks at the same time, but what you should do is that when a buyer, um, when you're working with buyers, then you're the employee because you gotta work nine to five. Not only nine to five, you gotta work nine to nine. You gotta work. They gonna call you at seven o'clock in the morning. They gonna call you at nine o'clock at night, and they think that you are their own. You, they think that you're your only client. So always. You just said that the reason, one of the reasons you want to get into real estate so that you can have the flexibility to become your own boss. And so you definitely want to know that listings are the name of the game. So make sure you remember that listings are the name of the game. Ten listings in the pipeline. When you get ten listings in the pipeline, I mean straight listing, I think it's time for you to start building a team. If you have under ten listings, uh, you don't really have to build a team, but you can if you want to. If you want to and you only have one deal, you can. You can start learning what it takes to become a team player. You can learn it, but I would say you're good to go if you have 10 listings in the pipeline. Bring value. 
as we say, because listings are the name of the game. You have to bring value to it. You have to be able to do those things. You have to be able to put that energy onto the self. So you, you be important. And when I say that, go to the shores. Don't, you know, what we you know, we got ladies. Description of the property has to be in the listing, the pricing terms, 
and the seat and or commission. Those are the things that has to be in the listing agreement. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the organization of a listing agreement. These are some things that's helpful. Florida Association of Realtors, they have already made it easy, made it smooth for us. They've already laid out an agreement, and this is pre-printed already. But if you have a client, sometimes clients, they get sophisticated, and they want you to change and tear out things and make some major changes. Anytime you're talking about making a major change, you cannot use this specific agreement. You have to seek an attorney. And you are not an attorney, you are not a CPA, and we really have to keep that in mind because we can get in trouble for that right there. And a lot of times we think that we're acting as a realtor when we're acting as an attorney. And so that's a no-no. So we have to be mindful of the information that we're giving out. But when, they're, when the client wants extensive modification, you cannot use this here. They have to have seek legal counsel. On the listing agreement, when we do a listing agreement, fill in every blank, every box, even if you have to put zero or in a, fill in every space that you can. When I see a contract comes over, I already know what type of agent that I'm working with. When I see a lot of the forms not filled out and it's not complete and they don't take the time out to do it, I, I identify them as not a good agent because it, this is, this is one of the things that I say. The average house is about what? 250. 250, okay. The average house is 250, and we get paid 3% from that normally. That's a lot of money at one time, because sometimes we can get paid a salary in three months that somebody on their job probably won't get paid the whole year. And so what that means is that we're dealing with $250,000, but because we cannot, we're not touching it in our hand, we get lazy and we don't take, we don't utilize our expertise. Don't take, don't, don't take your clients for granted. Work with the spirit of excellence when you when you're dealing with clients. Because they pay us, but we've gotten so lazy as a real estate agent, as a as a whole, not just each individual, but as a whole, we got lazy. We don't want to do anything. We don't want to complete the listing agreement. We don't want to give our clients an update. So we need to understand that somebody's getting ready to sign on the dotted line for a loan for $250,000, or so even if they're paying cash, that's a lot of money. Just think about that money in your hand, or think about if you were the one on the other side that you're getting ready to put out and find $250,000. You want an agent to come with their A game or stay home. Mm -hmm. Line numbers. When you're talking to your client, if you need, if they're not in the same place as you are, you can see here, you, it's easy to tell them, uh, take a look at line number 13, we're talking about description of property. See, Florida Association of Realtors, they made it easy for us, they identify line by line. And also, if you look at certain lines, if you see where a fill in blanks, you'll see an asterisk. So the asterisk lets you know that, hey, you have to do something on that particular line. So it, it, it helps us. And every page is acknowledgement of receipt of page. That lets us know that the client has identified and notified each page, and it's easy. Page one of four, page two of four, page three of four, and page four of four. The reason they have it like that is because we go through so much paperwork is that we can at least count and identify how many pages that are part of the agreement. In the paragraphs, they're just they're just formatted to tell you what the paragraph is about. But don't hold to it. Don't just let that be all you do is just understand each paragraph. And again, for those who came in a little late, uh, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to stop me and ask. Three types of relationships. We'll talk about them a little later, but the transaction broker, the single agency, and the no brokerage relationship. Anybody heard of them? I know the newcomers heard of them all day. We, we tend to forget what they mean if you start seeing business long enough, though. 
So I'm not going to read them because we all should know. And if we don't know them, it is okay. You can get a copy of these slides and you will just learn them, okay? So and we're gonna talk about each one when we get on the listing agreement. This is the transaction broker. This is the single agent. That's the no brokerage. Even though it says no brokerage, it sounds a little deceptive, deceiving, because it says no brokerage. But when you enter into a no brokerage, you still have a relationship with the client. The types of listing agreement. Okay, there's actually two types of listing agreements for residential, two types. The we also have commercial. We do not use these two listings for commercial. We have a listing for land. We do not use these two listing agreements for land. The two types of listing agreement is the exclusive brokerage listing agreement and the exclusive right of sale listing agreement. The only, the exclusive broker is like, hey, Mr. John Doe, this is the neighbor. This is the, I'm your neighbor. And uh, you're selling your house. Hey, Valeska, I want to buy your house for you. And then you say, okay to me. So what that means is that you found a buyer, so now I'm kicked out. So that's not a popular form that us as real estate agents want. We do not want this form, let's repeat. We do not want this form, let's say this again. We do not want this form right here, this listing agreement. No, we don't. The exclusive right of sale listing agreement, they have three options for that. I mean, four options. And the reason they have that is because that's where it identify the agency relationship. You see here the no brokers, the consent to transition to transaction broker, single agent transaction broker. So the no brokerage, the no broker is the one with the least amount of duties. So what happens with that particular listing agreement is that what you're doing as a listing agent, you're actually just a paper pusher. All you're doing is pushing the paper. You cannot give and help them fill in the blanks. You cannot help them if they come to you and say, hey, Sandra, uh, what do you think? You think I should counter at $1,000 more? You cannot give them any ideas, any opinion. The only thing you can do is fill in the blanks. I'll your agreement. Right, right. What, what you, what exactly? You can upgrade it, but what we're saying is that that's what you do as a, a no brokerage listing agreement. Okay. You're right. You're right about that. Consent to transition to transaction broker. That's the one that we were using, but as of now, we are officially going with the ERS-17 TV. The reason that we're doing that is because. We're, and, I'm, and I'll be talking about the single agent and the transaction broker too. We don't have to do that because in the state of Florida, by statutory default, we're transaction brokers already. So we don't have to consent to transition over to a transaction broker. As a single agent, that's when you have the most duties. You have a stringent listing agreement. And so you can, you can only represent one, the buyer or the seller. You cannot represent both. In a, as a transaction broker, that's like the middle of the road. You can work with both. You can get both commissions. Do we do single agents in the state of Florida? Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. It's very rare in the state of Florida that brokers do single agent. And one of the reasons that they do that is they try to stand out from the rest of the companies to say, hey, I strictly work for you. And that's how they market themselves. But it's very minimum brokers who does the single agent. Again, because in Florida, by statutory default, we are transaction brokers. Limited service, on limited service, all you're doing too is you're just saying, hey, I'm going to put the property in the MLS, go do whatever you want to do, set your showings up, do whatever you want to do, and I'm just going to charge you a flat fee. Any questions on the agency relationships? 
no brokerage consent to transition to transaction broker. So this is the listing agreement moving forward. This is the one that we're going to use. We will initially use consent to transition to transaction broker. If you knew nothing else about a listing agreement and you had to go to a, a listing agreement right now, you would just take a snapshot of that right there, memorize that by heart, and go in there and you would sell a customer. You would get that listing agreement. So this is just your listing agreement, understanding this right here. And again, if you do get these slides right here, the first step that you should do is memorize this right here. That's your listing agreement in five minutes. So now we're going to, we're going to write now, we're going to write, I want everybody to participate so you will have your own sample guide. We're going, you can create the names that you want to, the only name we don't create is K1 Realty. Okay, that's your brokerage. That's y'all to be brokers too, okay? <laughs> so right up here, so we're going to use the seller name again, create what you want to. You can do an individual corporation, estate, trust, power, of attorney. So now the agents, you will know how to put that because a lot of times you will try to figure out, well, what happens if there's a trust? What happens if there's a power of attorney? What happens, and I, this is one of the things that I know that some of my agents are even doing too. When there's a corporation, they're having the client, there's um, Joe, this ABC company. What they're doing is they're having the person, the seller, sign as ABC company. That's the initials that they're doing. That a person, an individual, has to sign that particular listing agreement. He can't go in as barbecue food and then the initials at the bottom is BL. So right here, fill in your, your, your seller's name and your brokerage. So when we have an entity like that, how? I'm oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. When we do have an entity like that, that location, how do we supposed to put them for them to for them to? How do we list the officer? When so what you do? So this is what you do when you go into foreign simplicity and you're doing it electronically. If it's Karen Lewis, you're going because what's going to happen? When you go over to Foreign Simplicity and you go where the email address is, it's going to come up with that corporation's name. So you're going to go back and edit that as that person's name. And then on page 12, you can also insert uh, whatever it is. For example, Barbecue Food LL Signature Line, Mr. Bar Watermelon President LLC. So you're identifying who that individual is on that corporation. And you can also check it, remember, because you always want to do the best that you can. So you take that extra step and go on Sunbiz and see if that person is actually an officer or what role that they're playing. Mm -hmm. this, this right here, hey, Iris, um, this right here gives the seller gets the broker exclusive right to sell the property. And here are the terms of the listing agreement on what we were talking about. So you can create your own terms, and this lets us know that the seller cannot discriminate. I know Iris was to a listing once or just recently, and the uh, lady uh, said, I don't want to sell to black people. Well, Iris ignored that, and I don't blame her for ignoring that and not getting into that right there. But if she signed that listing agreement, Iris, as a real estate agent, cannot discriminate. And this also lets us know that that seller is legally giving us the permission that they can give us the permission to sell that property. Do you all have your expiration date? Your your date, your date start and your date ending of your listing agreement. Okay, now um, on that, I think can we be pretty more specific? Let's say for example today's 27. So I have a 327.19 on my listing will be 326.2020. Your expiration date. You see, when we say we're listing a property for one year, 
you would do it like that. You would do 327 and then 326. Mm -hmm. Now, it's nothing wrong if you do 327, 327, but it's actually not a year. And what you're telling your client is that this is a year's listing agreement, so you have to have the date like that. Description of property. Put the complete, the, uh, complete address. If there's a unit number, put the unit number, city, state, and zip code. When it comes to names and legal description, also in addition to these slides, we can tell you how to find, I'll send you an email on how to find a warranty deed. You can get the legal description from a title policy or a survey too, because most times, not most times, there are some times when the MLS and the IMAP, the tax roll, the legal description is not correct. So you want to find it on the warranty deed, title policy, or survey, so you want to put it there. And if you have if you have a warranty deed, make a copy of that and attach that with your listing agreement and put C attachment. And you can, you can create, if, if that's exhibit one, attachment A, addendum, whatever you want to, you can create it like that. And personal property, in, including appliances, the seller's disclosure and identifying personal property are the two largest things that can make or break a deal or have to incur. Seller's disclosure and talking about what's going to stay and what's not going to stay. So one of the things that can help you when it comes to personal property, and this is what I normally do, I would have a sheet of paper when I go to my client's house and I would I would, I, I would create new blocks. Keep it simple, but make it where there's, where you can minimize errors. I'm telling you because if anything in real estate could go wrong, it, it will go wrong. And you won't know most times that it's wrong until you messed up. So what I would do, I would get a block or even page by page, and I would say kitchen. This is what I would do. I would say kitchen. And I would go and walk through with the client and say, are you leaving this right here, this microwave? Are you leaving this refrigerator right here? Are you leaving this stove right here? And I would take pictures of it. Not only would I take pictures of it, when there's a contract on it, I would send it over to the agent too. So everybody is on the same page. So when the, when every, when the buyer does their walkthrough, they cannot come back and say, hey, you told me you were going to leave this wash and dryer, and now there's another wash and dryer. You have to keep it simple, but you have to protect your license. That's the key in real estate. So that's just something extra. Always, if you can, take that extra step. Remember what I just said. Sometimes we get lazy and we don't want to take that extra step. But our license is on the line because a seller's disclosure or a personal property in a house, you, whether you're going to leave it or not, you will just can destroy it. Price in terms of the property. This is just where you're going to put the price of the property on what the seller wants to list it the cash convention of VA. The only other thing that I could think about where it says other is the 10, 1031 exchange, and that's selling real estate simultaneously. I do have the exact definition in the back at the end of the slides. And most times we don't do assumption of mortgage. Can they do it? It is possible if the bank wants to do it. Most times the sellers do not know if they have an assumption of mortgage or not. Sandra P. Um, where's for the occupancy, right? Is that what, where for the occupancy? Did I miss that idea? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. If the, the property, if there's a tenant in the property, then you have to put that property is currently occupied, the property is not, and you're going to put the, the term the lease expires because when a buyer moves into that property, they have to honor that lease. So that's definitely important that you do put that information. So if it is not, then you put is not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so right here, as I was stating, that most times sellers don't know uh, whether they have an assumption of mortgage. Again, we used to do that a lot years ago. One of the reasons we used to do that because the interest rate was sky high, like 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 
twenty percent. So mm -hmm. we would do an assumption of mortgage. But when you do that, the client still has to qualify for that mortgage, and they don't feel it to be an assumption. Mm -hmm. And here, this is sometimes that I normally put like if the seller we want the seller to pay any closing calls, and so I would put three percent. But I would let my seller know that you really don't have to. But you can pay, because sometimes buyers want money back. So I'll just put 3%, but I'll let my seller know that this is not written in stone where you have to. Maybe you want to do 1%, but whatever you do, it won't exceed to 3%. I mean, past 3%. We used to could get 6% back, like nothing. But now, you know, I'm not sure. Anybody knows if you can get past 3%? Does anybody know that? Yes. Um, yes. You can't you can't get six percent or three percent. Have you have you all tried to get six percent back? Anybody tried to get six percent back? No. No. Try that one day. Let me know. Ask for it. You just act like you asked for three percent back. A seller has agreed to give buyer six percent back for closing calls in a they don't have to. They don't have to. <laughs> zero. It's negotiate. You can put zero too. Sure. You, okay. So let me. Yes, Andrew. Yes. You can. You can. Uh, we just. I just personally do that just to give them a heads up that the buyer may ask for. Them. But some sellers are saying they're adamant about no. Right. You know. And um, we we you. <laughs> hmm. No, I don't need you to know why. Sometimes you would. Sometimes you would. It just depends on the circumstances. Sometimes if the house is messed up pretty bad and you want to get out of that house, you might say, okay, you know, I want a buyer, but I know that my house is not up to par, so I, I might give them some money. Or you, you start to do the deal, and then once they go through inspection, they may need some money to close or to help you prepare. So it just depends on the situation before you can actually say, no, I won't give this other more money back. You know, so it depends on the situation. Sandra already said, no, I won't give this other money back. That's a Sandra for you. That is a Sandra for you. Sandra P and Sandra D. Yes. 
um, right here where, okay, we have the 30 years. So the mortgage is a term of 30 years beginning in, and then we put there what? Zero, because it's not an assumption. No, no, no not an assumption. I'm talking about, you, you're talking that, about, oh, okay, that is assumption, okay. Okay. See all that part right there, it's that's an assumption. Okay. Okay. Well, you can leave that blank. You can leave it blank. Well, as a K-1 agent, as a K-1 agent, we're not leaving it blank. We're going to fill in every blank. <laughs> I give away stuff, Vita. Vita said, I don't know if you have a challenge or give you a challenge. <laughs> she said every line. <laughs> yeah, so we don't want to leave it blank. I, I told them, I think you heard me. When we see a contract comes in and it's not completed, we've already said that's a bad agent. So you want to you want to bring your A game as an agent. So you want to fill in every line, either zero or in, a or fill it in. Even when they say uh, three days, if left blank, three days or whatever okay. the number is, you still put, put the, the number in. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what I was going to ask. Even if the language is there, still yes, put it in. Yes, you'll put it in. Because mm -hmm. again, you want to protect your license and you want to minimize something that comes back. You in Hawaii somewhere, then I'm calling you, Kay. Kay, what did you do? You didn't put this in. So, and you can't even remember what claim is that. I closed by like a deal. And then you can't remember. This one right here, I want you all to see this. This is simple though. Broker agrees to make diligent and continued efforts to sell the property until a sales contract is pending on the property. So what that means, even if the listing is overpriced, you have agreed to still work that listing. It does not matter. You agreed to take the listing, so you have to work it. Yes, and you have to figure it out. Okay? Did you all? Yes. Go back. Yeah, with the seller, um, with the financing terms, so should, should we check off cash, conventional, and yeah. Whatever the buyer, uh, okay, so here, here's the book. If it's a condominium, call the association. Most condominiums are not FHA. Most of them are conventional and cash. So you would only put cash and conventional, okay? If the, and then you would know, you would identify what type of financing can take place on that particular property that you're listing. So sell your, I mean, do your due diligence when it's time for the listings. Overpriced or not, you committed to it. Your name is on that dotted line. Multiple listing service. That just lets you know, let the uh, notify the seller of the MLS requirements for us. We do have to put the property in the MLS. We have 48 hours, so you can do one or the other, because sometimes we want to get a professional photographer, or we want to have the property staged before we list it. So if you decide that you want to do that, then maybe you should not put a date on it, but if you do put a date on it, there's a form that's in the, from the MLS, it's in the back on one of the last pages, it's in the back and you can use that. That seller has to sign that. And if you know that you need professional pictures and you want the end for the house stage, then you might as well have that form signed at the listing agreement. Because you cannot hold legally, based on the MLS requirements, you cannot hold that listing without having that, sign, that form signed. And you need it signed because, again, a seller will come back and say, why my property is not in the uh, MLS? Can we have them sign it and not yet future date it? Can you have them sign it and future date it? Yep. Yeah. Because we got to get some pictures. Wait, 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 wait. Let me, let me tell you. There's really no need to have them future dated. You can do it, Sandra, but there's no need. Bring the, bring the form, bring that form with you as a part of your agreement and just have them oh, sign that. Awesome. Our form? Right, right, oh. in the top one. Feel, feel. All you have to do is just have them sign them. Because see, let me okay. tell you something. Because if you, again, it's almost like when you do a post-dated check. Post-dated checks are really not honored, but people do it. Okay, because if you take that check and go to the bank, the bank can uh, deposit that check, right? Yeah, they could deposit, just can't cash it. 
seen other Cassandra D. I seen other forms. That's the form. That's the form. Yeah, that's okay. the form. Right? No, no. That's the same. Me and you said the same thing a, a while ago when I went back and forth with them some time ago. Okay. So that is still the form. That's it's, what they said. So which one do you check that? The first one. one. saying that you don't want to talk to your mother. Yes. That's the first one. You would check it. And, I, and that's the same thing I said. And he said, the reason that I'm having an issue with it is just the language. And that's how my brain says the same thing. It does not say that, but that's the thing. So you're saying this is also the form to put the MLS at a later time, right. it, yes. not within the 48 hours. So if you need time to take pictures, you can put it up two months later right. and find this form. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Sandra Peake. Yes. <clears throat> On the MLS when we're uploading pictures, it says that you have to have a mandatory of or up to 35 pictures. Mm -hmm. No, no. That's not it's not the max. Not because you have one. Maximum. Maximum. 35. Oh. I did retract mandatory for those. Oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 next, next. So, so that's that's what that is. So put your um, listing. Put your pictures in there. But again, you know, uh, Kate, definitely for compliance, 48 hours. Go okay. ahead, Kate. <laughs> okay, so back to this opt out form. So if you're saying that. Yo, you know, okay, let me talk about but, the opt out form. Wait, wait, wait a second. Then you okay. go. I think y'all have to call the board on that. I fought that too, because the language does not make sense. That's correct. <laughs> it does not make sense at all. I talked to the board, I talked to Travis. Even when I got ready to have this presentation, I called the board again because the language is not right. But what I'm saying is, okay, so we have them sign this form in order to give us the time to put the pictures in there and get them, you know, everything professionally done. Should we go back in and have them sign something else just sure. alleviating this form no. so cover ourselves? No. Yeah. Well, then you just put it in. Just then put it in. Then okay. you talk a turn option. Not saying, you know, I give my broker. So here's the funny part about it. Here's the fun, here's the funny part about it. They have a form in the MLS on the board. If you look on the member services, they have a form that says it, but they said no. They said no. They they literally have a form, but you know we can be spokespersons for the board. And you need me to go back and find. And tell well, I think they need to have a third option. Mm -hmm. Third option with a plan. Mm -hmm. Say you're giving the, the broker two months or two weeks or whatever to put that in. I'm, I'm, I'm in yeah. totally agreement. But you know, I'm going to put a website third version before. Okay. I took a lady out to Chicago to see one of the, um, she wanted to see 55 year olds or older community. And we were having difficulties with our, the um, super opera file was super. Um, she said, that's okay, Iris. I already saw the pictures on the internet. I want to put a contract on it tonight. Mm. Well, you had a pretty good client because oh, like like this most, of the clients, most of the clients are saying, yeah. those pictures that you tell me, they don't tell the truth. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't want this house right here. And sometimes the pictures make the house look better than it really is. Most yeah. Yeah. Especially when you get professional pictures. Marlene, in reference to the forms, my personal belief, as far as the board is concerned, they are the people who have had to see the litigations in reference to how these documents stand up in court, mm -hmm. and they know the reason why that they choose one versus the other. You and I haven't been on the other side of the table, right. and so it, you know, so ultimately, you know that their goal is to protect you. So I wouldn't spend myself questioning one versus the other. They've seen the cases. They've seen what they request. And so I'll just sign the paper that they say because afterwards I can go back and say the board. But if I say, oh, Marlene thought, you know. Well, I go back and bust out. And I, 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 hey, hey, Marlene, that's the broker. I can go back and bust out. Like, this does not make sense. Because guess what? Somebody like me is going to come to me or Sandra D. They're going to come to me and ask me questions. And I'm going to like, you know, so I have to go and fight, but not only that, 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 but not only
I would yes. suggest go to what, what form they say because sometimes they can they can choose the wrong form or they can omit certain things and one for one thing in the form can make it different. Right. And even with this one, when it says that with the participant gotcha. that it's keep you keep it for, you keep it for one year or it's valid mm. for one year. So mm. as a as a realtor, if I'm putting this in my form and if the client ever come back and says, oh, well, I said I didn't want them on it, yeah, that's, so that's, right. that's why I was saying maybe yeah. have something yeah. just like a checklist, yeah. bring a checklist right. for yourself and just saying, okay, I know that you signed. I signed this form previously, but on this day, I am, you know, uh, retracting whatever it was that I said before. So it's like that. Okay. Okay. I think that. From this, from the okay. So, so long story short, with that seller opt out form, mm -hmm. you call the board. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, you can have. You can if you know you're gonna list the property. You better bring that home stager and that photographer that within those 48 hours, you better be able to do your work in 48 hours and still deal with the spirit of excellence. But you know, on a serious note, that's the form. The only disadvantage, I understand totally what you're saying, Marlene, but the disadvantage is when you have a sharp client and you take Correct. that, they're gonna say the same thing that we say. Correct. Why is this? This does not make sense. And they may not even want to yeah. sign it. Yeah. You know, so you know, just you know, be that best agent that you can be. And if there's a problem, then you can say, hey, I'll come back or do what Sandra said and, and put it for a future date if it's gonna cause problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. I wouldn't do it. I would not do it whether it's real or not. Me, me, but that's good. I would not do it. And, I would, and this is how I would do it. That form, even though it does not have the terminology on there where we can understand it, I would let the client, I would have the same conversation that I'm having with everybody here and tell my client that this is the way they have it in this terminology. And I think when you sit down and talk to a client and they get ready to sign and listen agreement with you, they trust you. Well, at least I hope they trust you. You can do that. You can, but again, me, if I know that I'm not going to have it in 48 hours, I would have them sign that form. I would take that form with me because that's what the board requires. See, even if you haven't signed it and you change the date on it, you can, you can change the date, but the board, because it has to go into the MLS a certain time. Correct. This right here is just what seller authorized broker to do. We normally put, one, display the property on the internet except the street address. If the seller, this is general advertising, if the seller, seller does not authorize, then you can't even put the property in the MLS. You have to make sure if the seller, some sellers don't want for sale signs in the yard, but if they do, then you put your for sale sign. That's letting the seller know that it's okay to do those things. Obtain information to the present mortgage. You want to ask your seller if there's a mortgage to get a payoff. That's one of the first things that I would do in the listing presentation. I would ask my seller to get me a 30-day payoff. It can be verbatim. They don't. They can do it over the phone. You don't necessarily have to have them send a letter or fax it. You can, but if they can do it over the phone and get you the number, then you want to know what their payoff is. Because sometimes sellers don't even recognize that they may even have a second loan, or sometimes sellers don't even think that a home equity line of credit and they have to pay that off as well. What line is that? C. 58C, provide objective com comparative market analysis. And all of this is about advertising the property, getting a lockbox on it, and, and the type of agency relationship that we have act as a transaction broker. And when we come down to a virtual office website, that's a part of advertising at the same time. Now, if a seller checks one of those in, that means that we cannot put their property where you ever see the links and the sites that have the value, what the comparative, what their value is. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, sellers don't want that, but most of our sellers really don't mind what website is on because once it goes into the IDX, IDX feed, it can go all over the internet. And if they don't want anybody, you know, making a comment on their property, 
Again, most sellers do not have a problem with that because they're trying to maximize their advertising so they can get their property sold as soon as possible. On the count of three, everybody say this. One, two, three. Money, money, money. One, two, three. The conversation. <laughs> so this is the conversation part right here. This is about our money, right? So this is our more right here. Seven, six or seven percent on 99 a. If you don't know anything else, six or seven percent. And you can put plus your processing fee. Okay. Oh, processing. Right. You can put it right there. Huh? Right. Ooh. Processing fee. Where would you the processing fee? Right mm -hmm. next to it. Online 99 plus. Right next to it, right? Where it says 6% of the total purchase price plus. Okay. Okay. The, or if they're going to be just charging a flat fee. Okay. Now, we charge processing fees. They have not done anything with processing fees yet. Okay. The talk is, is that they're going to stop processing fees. The reason for that is that we're charging buyers and or sellers to do what we're supposed to do anyway. If you, if you pay for marketing, if you pay for pictures on home stage, maybe you can charge for that. But we're charging people to process their files. And this is what we do in the line of our duties. Mm -hmm. It's not unethical, but they're talking about it. We were taught that for we can charge a client anything for a commission. And so we used to put, instead of putting a processing fee or a transaction fee, we used to put buyer has agreed to give K1 Realty Group a flat commission fee of $395 because you can charge whatever you want to on a commission. Most times agents don't do it because they don't know how to tell their buyer that they're charging them a commission fee. But for right now, you can do a transaction fee, but you're really charging them to do something that you already do in the course of your duties. Not a problem. And I know it's awesome. We used to explain it, we used to explain it before the class <coughs> time, I think, like as a document handling, and you had the broker had to store the documents certain amount of time. But that's still part of the duties. The broker, whether you pay or not, the broker still has yeah. to do that by, by Fred Law. I guess that can be like when people, when so somebody they bought it, like, don't push it one way or the other. Say that again. Saying. So you're saying that the client kind of not comfortable with it, don't push it one way or the other. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, if, if you want to save your deal and the client is adamant about not doing it, you cannot charge it. But you can charge it because remember what I said is that they're, they're not stopping it right now. Okay. But it's going to come a time that they're talking about okay. it that they want to stop it. And so what we used to do, because they talked about it years ago, we used to say, we will charge our buyer a flat commission fee because again you can charge anything you want for a commission and add it in kind of so. and add it in okay and gotcha. it's the same thing it's gotcha. a process of the k k first no i was just thinking about what you said because i remember the way that it comes up in the you know in our documents as a commission fee and i changed it to the transaction fee but you're saying you <coughs> pretty much tell our buyers for instance they'll ask you how much does it charge for how much do you charge to help me and a lot of times, like, there's nothing for you to pay up front. Maybe we can put it in at, hey, that's paid at close. Right. And this that's is what I would say. I say, like, if, I'm, if I was talking to a client, I would say, when I'm talking to them and we're doing a contract, I'll say that, you know, we're going we're gonna to charge you a flat commission fee of three ninety five, dollars but you don't have to worry about it because it's a part of your closing right. card. And I'm finished with it. Like that's that. the end of it. Okay. And that fee varies from office to office. No, person to person. Person to person. <laughs> yeah. Agent to agent. Because sometimes I see five ninety five. <laughs> sometimes you don't see no fees. Sometimes you see one seven ninety five. Yeah. Yes, that's what she's <laughs> saying. Sandra, for anybody that does not know, Sandra is in her own world. <laughs> Best show. That's not a bad thing. But I mean, it's your it's your seven ninety five. I've never done it, but if it works for you and your client agrees to pay it, you can get it. Pay your best. 
But one, one thing about them is that, and I'll, I'll share with you two ladies, is that one thing that they do that's very important, and they disclose all this up front, they never take a client out and they have not had a bias initial consultation. And so they lay all of this out before they take them out and see if it's a fit and if the buyer wants to pay that. And they also have a bias brokerage uh, form that they uh, mm -hmm. sign, just like the listing agreement. Mm -hmm. Cooperation, yes, you do have to share that 6%. Sellers sometimes, and, and sometimes you have to let sellers know because they don't understand how this commission is paid. As soon as they see 6%, that sometimes sellers literally think that you get it, you, just the agent, you're getting the 6% by yourself. But it go, if you're splitting that four ways. So this is the compensation that goes to other brokers. Now, you said something? Yes, I'm sorry, um, B. Uh, which is 102. What did you okay. have? Sorry, what did you have there? Okay, okay, so I missed it. Okay, so here, let's go back to 90, 99, no, no, 102. 102, 102 is an option. You can put a, a flat fee or a commission. Most times we don't do options. Uh, uh, most times options are in commercial real estate. An option is something like when a seller has the property set aside for a particular buyer and the buyer has to do their due diligence in qualifying for that property or they have to do whatever it is that they want to do in order to get that. And so sometimes if an option never happens, then you don't get paid nothing. So then you can put your 3%. So when that option is exercised, you will still get some money. And here, if the seller say, hey, in, in line 105, I passed all that. Thank you, Sandra. 106, if the seller says, hey, I no longer want to sell. I want to lease this property. I want to lease it out. So I would normally, because the rental is 50%. So I would normally put 50% of the gross lease value. That's what I would put. So if the client does decide to lease it, then I'm covered. I'm going to get my commission. Everybody understand everything so far? So okay. 102 is 3%? I would put 3%. Yes, I would put 3%. Which line is 102? That's line 102. And line 106, 105, I'm sorry, I would put 50%. I also have a book. Oh, oh, you missed out on writing your listing agreement. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Iris. You too. <laughs> Everybody got that? Okay, so here is our protection period. I, in line 112, I normally put. 90 days after the termination date. I put 90 days to protect me. So should the seller decide that he wants to pull out of it, and that's part of the conditional termination, and we'll get to that. Some sellers are so sneaky, that's just the way it is. I had a client call me um, once. I went to show a property, and then I left my card there. The client literally told me, hey, my listing will be over in three days. Mm -hmm. So now, do you want to buy, does your, your client still want to buy? Mm -hmm. Now, I came to show, I showed that property while she was in the listing agreement. That broker can come after her. Even if she pays me commission, that broker can fight for that commission. Because mm -hmm. they're in that protection period right there. Now, if they relist the property, then you out of gas. You can't do anything. It's over. But you still, the broker still can come back if you've shown that property. And so you want to be careful with that, though. Because again, sellers, they, they, a lot of times, they act like they don't know that, but they'll wait because so many times in real estate, you have so many people going in your ear. You have your uncle going in your ears. You have the dog named Scott going in your ears. You have your cousin. Everybody is telling you something. And sometimes somebody's going to try to tell you something so you can be with them. Mm -hmm. Retain deposits. I normally put 50%. So if there's $5,000 in escrow, 
and the buyer pulls out, seller goes after the money, seller has that money. You can get 50% of that money. You can. Or you can say, let the seller have it, and you just continue to find that seller property. You know, so it just depends on you. But you can, if you put 50%, you can get 50% of that money that was in escrow. Mm -hmm. I've only done that in 18 years. I've done it once. I did get the money. I got some of that money. Which number is that? Mm -hmm. 117. I actually had to um, negotiate that with the seller. It wasn't that, it was just while we were going over the information. And the 50% is like, what is this? And I was like, well, if you have, if there's escrow, for whatever reason, you go after the escrow because the buyer pulls out and um, you get any of that back, then, you know, you're going to split that with me. And he's like, well, why should I give you 50%? So I would have to talk and, you know, the reason why I should get the 50%. What did you tell him? And I basically, I told him, you know, I'm listing the property. I'm, you know, I'm going after the buyers. I'm bringing people in. I'm doing the open house. So this is just to say to compensate me for some of that work that I've done. And when we negotiated, end up going to he was like, well, well I say thirty percent, and I was like, I, I think you know I'm worth more than thirty percent. But at the end of we came with forty five percent. We still didn't get fifty okay. percent. So but 45. I had to negotiate. Yeah, I had to negotiate and tell him why. And so that's a sharp seller too. It's yeah. to say, hey, why should I give it was you fifty percent though? Oh, oh, they <laughs> oh, they don't tear the cards right <laughs> off. It was an investor. <laughs> Now, if I have a decent, I'm on camera, but let me say it anyway. I'm just going to put it on K1 Connect. But if I had a seller who was almost like, like a nightmare or something, I, I probably would. But if I got a seller that's decent and they're doing everything they can and it just happened that the buyer backed out or something, I'll go ahead and let them keep that money. Mm -hmm. Even though I put it, I've never had anyone to say, you know, want to negotiate that, mm -hmm. but that goes to show you that, hey, you're one of the agents that are going over your listing agreement with the client. Because a lot of times when you don't go over, they don't even know that it's in their contract because they depend on us so much that they're not even reading their listing agreement. And that's why it's your duty, it is your responsibility, it is our job to go over the listing agreement. If you don't know anything else when you get out of school, learn your as is contract and learn your listing agreement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something I was taught at the very beginning. As a lady, I was taught that uh, the lady taught me, she said, for the living training, she said, take the agreement, the agreement and the listing as is. Place it by your bedside and read it in recreational. For your mm -hmm. recreational reading, mm -hmm. she said, read it every day, every day. You would be amazed. She said, because you, she said you'll be the same thing you could be ready to say. She said, you would be surprised how many uh, senior uh, agents, agents do not know the, the, um, the contract. That's right. Because right. usually somebody else is doing it for them, yeah. they don't know it themselves. And, and sometimes this is what we do, you know, just on the side No, This is what we do, especially when we can go into Eastside. We go and shove it down their throat. Hey, I'm sending you over a listing agreement. I'm sending you over a contract signing. Mm -hmm. But we have not went over anything. And again, when you're dealing with $100,000, $200,000, $300,000, dollars $400,000, think of yourself in that situation. You owe that to your client. And if you don't do that for your client, you're not doing justice for your clients. Mm -hmm. So you're saying basically that we should sit down and go over the terms with them, even though we do electronic, send them electronic documents, schedule it like an appointment to go over the terms with them as well. Even if you don't meet with them personally, when you get ready to send something to somebody, call them and say, hey, let's go over this, because now you, they're not going to look at it. They're going to trust you, and they're going to initial and do exactly what you say. And then so when you're okay, they love you now. You're the best agent in the world. Right. Right. Then only to find out that when they got escrow and you want 50% of that money, they don't know, uh, you know, about they don't know anything about okay. it. Now they don't like you. Okay. And now they're ready to cancel the agreement. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Okay. So compensation to other brokers. Okay. So yes, you do have to give the other agent money. Those who think they don't have to, you do stand. You have to give the other agent. I like playing with you, Sandra. So yeah. I'm not first. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> you do have to give the other agent three percent. And they don't work for it, right? <laughs> well, let me show you something. Okay. So remember here what we said. 
Normally we put three, on line 123, we check that box and we put 3% of the purchase price or we put zero. You could put, a, whatever it is that you want to pay the agent, you could put it. Now to a single, <coughs> remember the single agent is supposed to be the highest person, the highest agency relationship. So you know, they kind of deserve 3%. Because they deserve. Everybody deserves 3%.
because you can tell them, hey, let me show you I can sell your property. And if you decide, give me 30 days, give me 60 days, give me 90 days, and if you're not satisfied with me, then there's no charge to cancel this agreement and you will put zero dollars. You can put the price whatever you want to as long as you and the seller agree. I used to put $395 if they decide to go. But if you have a client that's kind of wishy-washy and you know that they're not sure about what they want to do, you can put more if you want to. Dispute resolution. This, what this is just saying is that if there's a dispute, then you all try to solve it amongst yourself. If you can't solve the problem amongst yourself, then now it's time to get a mediator to come in. I can be a mediator, anybody can be a mediator. They probably, if it was Sandra D. deal, they probably would not want her broker to be a mediator because they think that I would be biased, so they wouldn't choose me. So you can go to American Mediation Association or any other mediator that's agreed upon the party, and um, they can mediate the, uh, the transaction. If you cannot solve the problem through mediation, then arbitration. If you want, if the hardest thing, you want to stay away from arbitration, but you can. So what's going to happen if you go to arbitration, then, especially when you go like with Freck, Freck, their, their arbitration team, it's almost like, even if you have everything in black and white, it's their perspective. Whatever their perspective is, that's going to determine who's going to be on the final outcome, who's going to win, what party. So again, keep your A game out there as a real estate agent because these things that they'll come back up and I'm telling you, they will hunt you. You're going on about your business two years and then all of a sudden somebody call you and say, hey, do you remember this client? You may not even forget that client. Or then again, you may say, yep, I remember. I knew it was going to come back to me. I should have done something and right. it's too late. One thing everybody else knows, Fred cares about who? The client. The, client the public. The, public. the public. That's all. They don't care about me. They don't care about you. They care about the public. And, I, and I've shared this story before to some of you all where I was working at Remax and a guy, he, um, he sent me a letter and he said, his lawyer sent me a letter saying they want to sue me for $10,000 for something. I'm like, $10,000 for what? And I actually remember the guy. And I'm like, oh my God, I was just like, I was fuming, right? So I took the papers home that night and I wrote up everything. I wrote up like five pages. I wrote up every step of the way, right? So when I got back to Remax the next day, we had an attorney on staff and he looked at the paper. He says, I understand all of that. He said, this is what you better do. Just throw that paper in the garbage can and give that man that money and leave that alone. So, and I'm like, no, no, I want to fight. I want to fight. He said, it's not even worth it. Give it to him. The guy just wanted money, so I ended up giving him $2,500 because he needed money at that time. Though. Mm -hmm. So, those are things that you want to avoid because when the going, the rubber meets the road, they coming out with the broker, they coming out with the agent, they coming out. It's almost like you're in a car accident. Mm -hmm. When you're in a car accident, they're looking for anybody and everybody that they can sue. That's the same thing a client would do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this part is just miscellaneous. This agreement is binding on sellers and brokers. So if a seller dies, the listing agreement is still in force. Thank if you. a broker dies, the listing agreement is still in force. Iris? Yes, because I saw the lady on the beach in the laboratory area, Ms. Marks. She passed away and they're still advertising her picture, her listings. And I'm like, the lady has passed away. Maybe she wasn't the broker. Yeah, she's the broker. She's the well, maybe they had another broker there. Maybe they had a successor. Mm -hmm. still, and, and the company is in her name. We can sell it upon death. We can if so they die. And also what this is saying is that that we can accept uh, faxes, electronic signatures, and so on, and they're valid. And you 
here are the additional terms. Uh, you can put any additional terms in there. And again, remember what I said, if it's a one sentence, maybe you can put that in additional term. The house is sold as is. But when it becomes extensive, you cannot use this contract right here. Dr. Yeah. K, if you put in that the property must appraise, must come in at appraised value, and then up above where it has appraisal addendum. If you put the clause, do you have to do the addendum or do you do either one? You can do either or. If you check the addendum, you, you got to put the addendum. Do the addendum. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. And the addendum supersedes that contract. The appraisal addendum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whatever addendum it is. Oh, okay. Could you give some examples? The only example that I can see is that the house is sold as is. Sellers will replace the washer and dryer with another washing machine or something, or a certain type of washing machine, mm -hmm. or something like that. That's the only example that I can think of right offhand, because I don't normally put anything in the additional term. Does anybody else have any additional terms that they've ever had to put in a listing agreement? Sell a concession. Sell a concession what? Is it actually sell a concession there more so? This is a sell, this is a listing agreement. Oh, this is, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I think it was <laughs> getting, getting. <laughs> like I got one track now. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, the additional terms in here is to sell a signature. You can complete all this information. Remember, you are, you are an agent that works with the spirit of excellence completed. <laughs> And authorized, I don't have to sign as the broker on here, authorized sales associate or broker. Either one of us can sign right there. And normally I would always use my cell phone right here. So those are the signatures right there. And if there's if there are three sellers, then what you're going to do when you go in form simplicity, you're just going to create another line. You can add another line in form simplicity. So if you have three or four sellers. Mm -hmm. And make sure, I know that you all are doing this, but make sure that clients get copies of their documents. Mm -hmm. Here's another thing, too, that you may want to do at closing. You may want to do the same thing that the title company does. Invest in, you know, some folders and, and give them all your documents and tell them to store it in a private place. Or even if you don't give that, give them that, then what you do is at the end of the, even though you've already given them their documents, at the end when the deal closed, you may even want to create a nice email and send it to the client with all the documents in it and giving them contact information or whatever. That's an A, a plus agent. You know, that's just food for thought. But make sure that you get copies and uh, make sure you complete this uh, right here too because if a client says, I never got a copy, at least you at least check it off and say it that, hey, yes, you need to get a copy. And they signed it also. We have a deadline to make sure mm -hmm. the copies of the, the I think 24 hours on that, right? Well, there's not, there's not a deadline, but you want to give your clients copies. As uh, soon as you get them, the documents signed, once they sign the listing agreement, and the agent and the broker signs it, or the broker, we like, say for instance, me and Valesco, she's the listing agent and I'm the broker. So we can sign first. And then when the client signs the listing agreement, you can put, when you're sending the email to the bottom on forms and places, you can say CC, and then that client will get the email too once all signatures have been taken care of and completed. So they'll automatically get it. And this right here is just that we are uh, national, we, we, uh, we operate on the National Association of Realtors. We are realtors. Um, you can't call us real estate agents, but we're realtors because we abide under the code of ethics of the National Association of Realtors. And that you cannot reproduce this contract. You cannot do it on behalf of the Association of Realtors. Are there any, any, any questions? Okay, I'm going to number four to okay, seven. Okay, so I did what is first of 1031 exchange. Oh, what is the one? No, 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 that's not What line are you on, Sandy? No, I thought you were finished. I am finished. I'm going to go back No, home. I'm just saying, um, back to um, four to seven. Line 47. Right. So we're going to do the seller upload form, but we also check it here, correct? 
if it's going to be over 40 mils. So we put a check yeah. mark. So those are two different yeah, things. No, this oh. talks about advertising on the internet, advertising the client's property. And so if they opt out, they're going to put 6 2. You're going to check that and they're going to sign that. That means that they do not want their property on the internet, right. which would not be feasible for them to check that. Yeah, but so is this one. So I'm not That's for the MLS. Oh. Okay, gotcha. Oh, that's for advertising, and that's for the MLS. Okay, gotcha. So they will only put their sign, um, their initials there if they're trying to opt out from the internet. Yes. But if they want to use the internet, nothing will go. And you would just check six six one. Mm -hmm. You check okay. six one, but they still initial, right? No, they don't. Have or they don't initial. have to initial. Okay. No. Okay. okay. Six two. So okay. they want their property to be on the MLS and on the internet. They will check number one six one. If they want their property to be on the internet, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. they would check okay. six, six one. Okay, and if they don't want it, that's yes. check six two. Six, six two. two. And then initially, if they check yes. six two. Yes, and, and what the good thing about form simplicity, if they check six two, it's going to automatically, well, actually, it'll say sign. They'll sign. Okay. Marlene, you were something? Yeah. The, um, what do we do with this modification to this agreement form? Okay, so the modification to listing agreement. Anytime you make changes, like you change prices, or you change dates, what else? Commission. Commission. You have to, whatever it is on there that you change, you have to have them sign that. See, a lot of times, again, we kind of get a little lazy, and we go to changing prices just on verbal. And we don't take the time out to send that over to our clients to get it signed. But we need that sign. Anytime we change your price, um, change price or commission or anything, then we have to uh, have them complete that form. Mm -hmm. So a regular email mm -hmm. to say I give some permission to change the price. Mm -hmm. I don't want to accept that. I would rather accept the form. You change. I mean, at the end of the day, if you ever come back, mm -hmm. you could use that. But that's why they have the form so we can make sure that we follow the form because we can't really lose with the form. They can fight that uh, in court. Mm -hmm. You know what I've learned, Dr. Karen, with these forms compared to doing it as an addendum? Um, it actually helps your deal because I've had one where, because with the, when you do an addendum and you send it over to the a title company or the underwriter, if any of them are out of line, they're going to want whatever addendum, even if it wasn't signed. So say for instance, you did one, two, three, but two wasn't signed and you just went to three. The underwriter is going to want the addendum for two. So, mm -hmm. but, say but, but it, okay, so say for, instance, did, say for instance, you did an addendum where you're saying you're changing the price. Okay, that's addendum number two. Mm -hmm. Okay, addendum number one for whatever you got some money for seller's concession. Okay, right, but, right. And then right. addendum number three did something else. When you send it over to underwriting, they're going to want all of the addendums. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you use a form, underwriting doesn't even know about this. That doesn't have to go as part of your contract. Mm -hmm. So it's better to use the actual form right. Right. Because thought, it, rather than using addendums to right. put your own little wording on there because if anything is out of whack, mm -hmm. they're going to make you either write something to say that you're omitting that mm -hmm. addendum mm -hmm. or they're going to say you're going to have, you know, you have to do so much more because that's part of the contract. Whereas when you're doing the actual form, you the, this doesn't right. even matter. There's no no connection. Because you're trying a logical right. order of Correct. 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 Right. Yeah, right. when right. I sold my house, I dropped the price a couple of times, mm -hmm. and uh, all he did was change the price on the form, and I initialed. He Correct. can't do that. Right. He, he can't do that. Stay for instance, he can do that. So stay for instance, you change it three times. But each time you change it, you did an addendum. Yeah, okay? So now, right. underwriting, and you still no, want to do No, I understand. But say that you did. Say that you did. You did an addendum for each price change. When you send that over to underwriting, you forgot to include uh, addendum number two. So mm -hmm. now your underwriting process is going to stop until they get addendum number two. Right. Whereas so if you do it on the form, right. exactly. Well, so but if you're right. using the actual forms, you're right. not creating addendums that underwriters going to be looking right. for. Right. That's what I'm saying. And the, and the last, so that's, that's a good thought. And the last thing, too, there's nothing wrong with scratching out. Scratching out supersedes the pre-printed material. Right. But one of the things, too, if you cannot read your contract after you finish and yeah. saw it over the place, right. 
you better get another one done. Because if you can't read it now, you're not going to be able to read it in five years from now. And you're going to need to know and it has to be legible on what that contract is. So you take a look at it. If you take a look at the contract or the listing agreement and you can't read it, don't expect me or Judy to read it if you can't read it. Right. And so you need to get... <laughs> Judy, you say something? I have I still have a question about this broker authority. Um essentially if the if we're gonna do a normal MLS it can be posted anywhere, they're allowing us to play signage in the yard, so on and so forth. We don't have to check anything in this section because I mean I'm asking. Because it says here, seller opt out, check one if applicable, and then it says display the property on the internet except the street address. If that's what they want, then we check that. If they don't have a problem with us displaying their street address, then we don't have to check anything. Correct. Okay. Correct. You're correct. You're absolutely correct. Any more questions? What was she correct? Wait. She was correct if the if the client does not have a problem with any of them, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, oh. Thank you, Thank you for clarity. Yes, she is correct. So if they're okay with putting their stuff online, so they're okay. Like they don't have to. And I am, and again, it's up to you. But but she's correct on what she said. They don't have to put anything. Oh Jesus, y'all. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, don't, I, I normally, I really, I've been missing the weather. I've been missing it. I'm sorry. I've been walking out the door with boots on 100 degrees, so I'm sorry. <laughs> when your thermostat broke, Dr. K, it don't matter. <laughs> when the thermostat gets broken, it's like, so, <laughs> it don't work like it's supposed to. <laughs> That concludes it, Sandra, at the point. <laughs> Any more questions? That, that ends our listing agreement. I hope you all got something. That's if you so didn't good. get a lot, just out, as I always say, figure out the one or two things that you can take from it and you can apply in what you're doing right hey, now. Hey, Sandra, sure. you said the listing. Anybody want to say something? Yes, please. Yes. When um, the contracts are being filled out and signed, if you have more than one person, say it's Mr. and Mrs. or whoever, the two people or three people that are listed on the contract, mm -hmm. please make sure when you initial, wherever there's initials needed, please, please, please have all the individual initials listed on the contract, whether it's the seller or the buyer. So if you have three names listed on the actual contract, seller or buyer, please make sure all three initials are in their slot. Because we can't move forward if everybody doesn't sign or initial. So make sure you all try to submit your paperwork, you know, as best you can. Because for her to say it then, we, there must be some issues going on behind the scene. And we're always trying to figure out how we can make your life easy. So with that being said, that concludes the mindset call. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.